In this video, you will learn how to make a player crouch and crawl. This will include altering the collision shape of the player so that they can crawl under obstacles, as well as how to check to see if the player is capable of standing back up or should remain crouched despite not holding a crouch key. Howdy and welcome to Game Endeavor. Learn practical dev skills and improve the quality of your games by subscribing and ding a ling in that bell. The biggest issue with implementing crouching and crawling is dealing with potential physics issues that may arise from it. Depending on your experience as a game developer, you may have noticed that it's generally safer to leave the collision shapes alone and not fiddle with them too much, but this can be difficult if you want your player to be able to crouch and crawl under obstacles. To prevent our code from becoming a complex mess of conditions and variables, we're going to use a state machine to simplify our logic and make it easier to maintain. I have a very short video on creating a simple state machine if you didn't bring your own. Once you're ready, let's go ahead and get started. When we go into a crouching state, we want to change our collision shape so that it isn't as tall allowing us to crawl under obstacles. But rather than modifying our current shape, we're instead going to create a new shape that will swap out while crouching. I'm going to duplicate my current shape since it will be similar to the standard shape. We'll change the names of the shapes so that they're not confusing, naming our normal shape as standard shape and the new shape as crouching shape. We need to make the crouching shape unique, otherwise it will modify the standard shape when we adjust the extents because resources are shared amongst duplicated nodes and our shape property is a resource. Since my shapes are rectangle 2Ds, I'm going to reduce the height of the crouching shape to a height that I want the character to be while crouching, and then I will need to lower its Y position so that the bottom is flush with our standard shape. This is important, otherwise when we swap between the two shapes, the larger shape will find itself stuck in the ground, which is great if your character is a sword, but not so useful as a bear. The character is going to start off using the standard shape, so we'll disable the crouching shape initially. The shape will gray out when it is disabled. Make sure that you disable at least one of these shapes and never have both of them active at the same time, otherwise you will encounter some odd behaviors if your character stands on another kinematic body 2D. If your character has a hitbox, then you may want to do the same for it as well. I'll rename mine just as I did the character's collision shapes. I am using a capsule shape 2D for my hitbox. But all you need to do here is reduce the height of the shape and increase its Y position to align it with the other shape. Go ahead and disable the shape you're using for crouching as well. In our player script, we're going to cast these four shapes into properties named Standing Collision, Crouching Collision, Standing Hitbox, and Crouching Hitbox. When the player is crouched, we're going to allow them to move around but at a reduced speed. We'll store this speed in a constant named Crawl Speed, which we'll be using from within our state machine. The state machine is going to organize the logic for the states. However, we're going to contain the logic within our player script. So let's go ahead and create a couple of functions that will handle what happens when we stand and crouch. We'll start with a function named onCrouch, which will be what happens just before we enter a crouching state. Inside of this function, we're going to manipulate the shapes that we created earlier. We'll disable the standing collision shape, which is what allows us to sneak under obstacles. However, we'd have no collision shape active, causing us to fall to the floor. We'll fix this by enabling our crouching collision shape by setting its disabled property to false. We're going to do the exact same thing for our hitbox shapes, the only difference being the names that we use. We're going to create another method named onStand, which will be what is called just as we're exiting the crouching state. For now, this method will be exactly as the onCrouch method, the difference being that we're going to invert what we did in that method, enabling the standing shapes and disabling the crouching states. We're going to come back to this later because currently this doesn't consider whether or not there's anything that would intersect with our standing shape once it is re-enabled. But for now, let's step into our state machine where we'll piece together the logic for our states. We'll be adding two new states, so let's go ahead and create those. The first being our crouch state, where the player is down but not moving, very similar to the idle state. Then we'll add a crawl state, where the player is crouched but either moving left or right, similar to the run state. The logic for this crouching state is very simple. Since they're so similar to the idle and run state, they're going to be treated almost exactly the same, with a slight difference to the move speed as I mentioned previously. To do this, we're going to go into our state logic method where we handle our movement processing, and add an else if condition. We'll create an array that contains the states states.crouch and states.crawl, and check to see if this array contains our current state. This will return true if our state is any of the states within this array. In my player script, I have modified the handle movement parameter to accept the speed value that the move logic will attempt to achieve. This will allow us to pass in a slower speed for our crawl state, which we'll do inside of our state machine by calling parent.handleMovement parent.crawlSpeed. For those of you that don't keep up with my platformer series, this method simply tells the player character to move in the direction that the player is given input for, 
there's an icon in the corner for how I create my platformer player controllers. Now we need to allow the player to enter the crouched or crawled state. This will be as simple as pressing the down input, which I have defined in my input map settings. In the get transition method, we'll add a condition that if input dot is action pressed down, then we should return states dot crouch. This is a state that has no movement. It is just the player ducking down, which is why we transition to it from the idle state, because during the idle state, the character will not be moving. However, we may also want to crouch from the run state, but by the nature of the run state, we will be moving, so we want to transition to the crawling state instead. So do the exact same thing we did in the idle transitions, but return the crawl state instead. Now at this point in the channel, Paul Bearer is getting a couple of years old and is starting to show. He's done throwing out his hip and needs our help getting him back up to on his feet proper. So we're going to create a states.crouch statement for our transition to help him out. In the statement, we want him to be able to stand back up, which for now we'll do by checking if our down action is not pressed. If this is true, then we'll return states to idle. However, this doesn't consider the physics issues that we mentioned earlier, so we'll return to this later. If our character becomes ungrounded, such as if they walk over a ledge, then we want them to be able to fall from the crouch state. We'll do this by saying else if not parent dot is on floor to check to see if the character is no longer grounded. If parent dot velocity dot y is less than zero, this means that the character is moving upward, so we'll return states dot jump. If the character is not grounded and is not moving upwards, then we'll assume that they're falling, so else return states dot fall. Paul Bearer may have found a shiny button while he is down there, and we'll need to crawl towards it, so we'll add that as a condition as well. However, if you've been following the tutorial thus far, there's a bit of an issue in our movement code from 3.1, that our velocity.x does not come to an immediate stop as it once did. So to get around this for now, we're going to check if the absolute value of our x velocity is greater than or equal to a certain threshold. This just gives the state a bit of leeway as to what is considered officially stopped since the small value isn't going to smooth the player very much in the grand scheme of things. We need to do the same thing for our crawling state, except we're going to transition to the run state when our input is no longer being held, and we will transition to the crouch state when the absolute value of our x velocity is below the same threshold we used in our crouch state. We have some simple transitioning and state logic in place, but we're not officially crouching yet. To do this, we're going to need to use our interstate logic method. We'll create a statement for states.crouch, which we'll call whenever we enter the crouch state. We want to play our crouched animation here, so we'll call the animation player cached in our player script and tell it to play the crouched animation. Recall that we created a method for what to do when we crouch. This is where we'll be using that, by calling parent.onCrouch. However, we could be transitioning to this state from the crawl state, which means we'd already be crouched and there's no need to crouch again. We'll add a condition to this to only crouch if our old state is not states.crawl. We also need to do this for the crawl state, except we want the animation player to play the crawl animation, and we want to make sure that states.crouch is not our old state before. We'll call the parents on crouch method. And just like we don't want to crouch when transitioning between our crouch states, we also don't want to stand between these transitions, so we're finally going to put our exit state method to use. This is a very special moment for everyone, so try not to let us down. In our exit state method, we're going to create a match statement for the old state. In it, we're going to check to see if our old state was not states.crouch, and we want to check if our new state is not states.crawl. If these are true, then we'll call the onSaid method for our parent. We will do the same again for our crawl state, except this time making sure that states.crouch is not our new state. And with this, we have the basis for entering and exiting our crouch states. We've put it off long enough, but now that we're able to stand back up from crouching, I suppose we should look at how we can fix it so that we don't have physics issues from doing so. In our player script, we're going to create a method named canStand that will return a boolean variable as to whether or not it is possible for the character to stand. To check for this, we're going to check if our standing shape would collide with any other shape that it would be masking for. We're going to be using a method similar to ray casting, but instead it checks for shape collisions. Much like ray casting, we're going to need the world space state. So we'll create a variable named space state and set it to get world 2 directspacestate Before we can perform the shape cast, we need to prepare the parameters for it. Godot contains these parameters in its own reference object called physics 2 d shape query parameters. So we're going to create a new one of these named query. We'll start by setting the shape to query by calling query.setShape and passing to it the shape from our standing collision. We also need to pass in the transform from our shape, which we'll do by saying query.transform equals standing shape.globalTransform. And finally, we need to tell the query which collision layer we're checking for. We'll do this by saying query.collisionLayer equals collision mask. Our player uses the collision mask to detect what to collide with, but in the query this is called the collision layer. 
If it's a bit confusing, then don't feel bad. In my opinion, it is poorly named. Our query variable is now set up. We can get our shape cast results by saying var results equals space state dot intersect shape query. Unlike the ray cast, this is going to return an array of results of everything that the query found within the shape. So we're going to need to iterate through the array. Potentially, we'll be removing some elements from this array if we don't want to consider them, which is easier to do if we iterate backwards through the array. So we're going to create a fancy for loop here saying for i in range results.size minus 1, meaning that the loop will start at the last element in the array. We then want to stop once we've reached the beginning of the array, which will be negative 1. And finally, we want to iterate backwards, which is again a negative 1. For readability, we're going to store the collider and the shape in some variables, the first being named collider, which we will set to results i dot collider. The second being named shape, which we will set to results i dot shape. The reason we've gone through all of this is because we don't want one-way shapes to prevent us from standing back up. If the player character is standing under a one-way platform, then it would be awful confusing to the player if they were unable to stand due to this. So first, we're going to check if the collider is a collision object 2D, because the next method we're about to call is only going to be found within the nodes of this type. Prepare yourself because this one is a mouthful, being collider dot is shape owner one way collision enabled shape. If this is true, then we are standing under a one way platform, and thus we should remove the element from our results. Now you might be asking yourself, what about tile maps? And why does the voiceover suddenly sound so different? Please, one question at a time. We're going to do tile maps now, and I just now found out how to do tile maps. Tile maps are a bit of a pain because the shape value we stored earlier is relative to each quadrant of the tile map, so it's not unique to each individual tile. As you can imagine, this makes it difficult to determine what tile our shape is overlapping. Well, the nice developers at Godot have helped us out here by putting the cell coordinates of the tile in the metadata for the result. We can use this to check for our tile. We'll say else if collider is tile map because the next thing we're going to be doing will be for tile maps only. We'll get the tile ID by saying var tile ID equals collider dot get cell V results I dot metadata. As I stated, the metadata is a vector two for the tile map position. Get cell V returns the tiles ID given a map position. Once we have the tile ID, we can then get information about the tile from tile set. Specifically, we want to know if collider dot tile set dot tile get shape one way, passing the tile ID as the first parameter. The second parameter is the shape ID, which I believe has to do with how many shapes you have placed on the tile. Unfortunately, the docs do not clarify this, so I'm just guessing. We're going to assume that it's zero because I don't know how to find out from our result. Most of the time, this is going to be good enough. If this returns true, then the tile is a one-way tile, so we can remove the results by saying results.remove. Now that we've parsed through our results, we're able to determine whether or not our player can stand, which is as simple as returning true if the size of our result equals zero, else returning false. With this method, we can now return to our state machine and use it to check if we can stand when transitioning to the idle or run state by adding it to our get transition method. You'll notice that while standing under a platform, we can now release our crouch button and the player will remain in the crouch state until we've walked out from under it. You may want to allow your player to jump while in a crouch state. Now that we have the can stand method, we can use it for this to prevent our characters from jumping when they shouldn't. Inside of our input method, where we're allowing the player to jump by pressing the jump key, we're going to add an or condition to this saying or an array of states.crouch states.crawl has the state and the parent.can stand. How you do this is very important, so pay close attention to the syntax. We're separating these with an or condition from our idle and run states because we want to check if the player can stand, but only when they're in the crouching states. We don't want to do this check if they're running or idle. I mean, we could. I won't be the one to tell you how to live your life, but it would be wasteful. There's a bit of an issue that we need to address now. In our get transition method, we allowed the player to enter the false state from our crouch state. And don't get me wrong, this is pretty important stuff. Otherwise, if the player were to walk over a ledge, they'd remain in the crouch state while falling. However, it's a bit of a double-edged sword, because if the player walks over a ledge while there's still a solid obstacle over their head, then they're going to enable their collision while it overlaps the obstacle, and you'll end up with some janky physics. We're going to fix this by only swapping out these shapes if it's possible to do so. Before we do this, we're going to create a simple function named isCrouch that returns true if an array of states.crouch states.crawl has the state else false. This will allow us to easily determine whether or not our player is in the crouching state outside of the estate machine. 
rather than having to write out a big line of code to check in our player script. Speaking of which, back to the player script. We're going to go back to our onStand method. We'll move our logic for our collision shapes below the hitbox shapes because there's no reason to apply this to the hitboxes since they don't physically interact with the obstacles. We're going to add an if condition saying if can stand before we swap out our shapes. However, this method is going to be called once, and if we can't stand, then this bit of code will not be called at all. We need a way of continuously checking if the player can stand and applying this bit of code once it is able to. We're going to do this by placing our code inside of a while loop, saying while standing collision dot is disabled and not state machine is crouched. Don't run your code just yet because this is an infinite loop. Quickly, we're going to break this down because a lot just happened here. When we try to stand up, our standing collision is disabled, which allows us to enter the while loop. The while loop will continue executing until our can stand method causes us to swap our shapes, which then causes the while condition to fail and not trigger again. We added the is crouching bit as a failsafe in case the player ever gets into a situation where they've fallen off of a platform but still can't stand, which is something you probably want to avoid in the first place, but in the event that it should happen, once they go into the crouch state, this loop will terminate. Should the series of events happen, then you may want to look into causing the player to go back into the crouch state once they're on the floor, something to consider. But as I said, this is an infinite loop because there's no break in the while loop that allows the player to get into a situation where they can stand. We need to allow physics to continue processing so that it can happen. So we'll add a yield method inside of our while loop after our if condition saying yield get tree physics frame. It is very important where you place this, make sure it is after the if condition, not inside of it. I've just launched my Patreon. I'll be using it to post about game development and some behind the scenes videos. I've already made a post about some tutorials that I'm working on, as well as a video of me roughing out the concept for a viewer requested video. You could even have a sneaky peek at the source code for future tutorials, or even design your own character to appear in the videos. So if you want to support the channel and get some new unique content, then consider being my patron.